there's a lot of people that think the stock market's in for a rough ride and it's, there's some volatility ahead and, and potentially some some massive correction. Now, I'm not necessarily in that camp, but I understand that there's risk in, in Wall Street, right? Um, Main Street, it just feels more comfortable to me. Main Street is like the house down the street. You can invest in that house down the street. That's why real estate investors, uh, a lot of times why they're attracted to real estate over over a Wall Street type investment. So that's one here. And then the active versus passive, if you are if you decide to invest in Main Street and you want to invest in uh, real estate, you can invest by owning the property or you could be a more passive investor and either invest in somebody else's deal and be an equity player in that deal, or you could be on the debt side, which is where I play and I, where I love. Um, the reason for that is it's totally passive and it's safer because debt is a priority over equity. Um, so when it really, when we talk about passive versus active, it's just how much, how much effort do you want to put into it? Maybe how much risk are you willing to take? You found the Real Estate Law Podcast because real estate is more than just pretty pictures and law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. If you're a real estate professional or looking to build real estate expertise, then welcome to the conversation and discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Law Podcast. Another episode for you here today that we're talking about investing and finances and ways to make money in this crazy climate that we're in these days. And Rory, today we're going to be talking about Wall Street versus Main Street, the difference between active and passive real estate investing. I know lots of people get confused about those things, hear the terms thrown around. They don't want to raise their hand and ask questions about what that means. And today we have an expert on our second favorite state, third favorite state, <laughs> That, and I'll explain why, that will clear things up for us. Right, Rory? Yep. And, you know, the way I would condense the title down a little bit is for the investors out there, where do I get the capital? You know, we, there are a lot of different angles out there, but we're going to be covering a few today um, in the private lending space. Let's welcome our guest. This is Kevin Amol. Did I, Amol? Did I say Amol? Amol. Yeah, very close. Amol. Kevin. Oh, I was practicing that also. Kevin <laughs> is the founder and president of Pine Financial Group. And Kevin, you are based in Denver, right? Or you're in Colorado? I am. Yeah, and I'm right. dying to know. Like third favorite, huh? I gotta, I gotta understand. Well, hey, he, there's 47 that are behind you, so you know, our first favorite state is where we live, Massachusetts. Our second favorite state is where we invest, New Hampshire, and then Colorado, because we have so many guests on this podcast from Colorado that I had to fly out there a couple weeks myself and and spend a week in Steamboat Springs, masterminding with some other short-term and medium-term rental operators. So what a beautiful state! I I had the pleasure of driving. I did this crazy drive where I drove from Denver after I landed to Cheyenne because I'd never been to Wyoming before. So that was my way of checking state number 45 off the list. And then I drove from Wyoming out to Steamboat. We spent a week in Steamboat basically and then drove from Steamboat to Denver. And my God, it's beautiful. In oh, yeah, you saw some good parts for sure. Yeah, it was, first of all, everybody drives like 85 miles an hour, which is <laughs> crazy to me because, you know, that's not what we have here in the Northeast. I mean, the speed limits are 75. So just add 10 to that, right? Yeah. And well, you have a lot more traffic probably. So you can't go that fast out there. Yeah. And I mean, the majority of my drive was like, you know, once I got out of the Denver Metro, you know, you're counting more cows than cars. Like at least in Wyoming you were. Yeah, and then once you go, like, yeah. Yeah, once once you're in the mountains, I mean, like, you know, these are these twisty, turny mountain roads where I kept checking the elevation that I was at. And I'm like, I'm at 10,000 feet. Like, I, I actually physically feel the air thinner, like, when I'm walking around in Colorado. It's amazing. But have, how long have you spent out there? Have you spent your whole life in Colorado? Yeah, it's an interesting story, Jason. I, I got out of the Army and I or got out of the Army. I got out of high school and went into the Army. And I grew up here. I was born in Denver, grew up in a suburb, went to the Army. Basic training down in Georgia, and then get, guess where they stationed me? Colorado. Colorado. Yeah, <laughs> so I think it's supposed to be here. Yeah. Fort, were you at Fort Collins? Uh, I, I was up down in Fort Carson, down in Colorado Springs. Okay, Fort Carson. Uh, Rory, have you been to Colorado or no? I've been to one conference in Denver, and that was yeah. The entirety of my Colorado ex experience was in the city of Denver. Yeah, and you know, up to this point, I'd spent I'd been to Denver a couple times. I've spent time in Boulder. I was there uh, for two conferences many many years ago, and that was my Colorado knowledge right there. Then this trip really, I feel like expanded it. But for some reason, like this podcast attracts a lot of guests on like yourself from Colorado. That's interesting. There's a lot of real estate investing happening in Colorado, so maybe it's maybe it's the the Rocky Mountain air. 
<laughs> Maybe it's opportunity. I don't know. Well, that too. I mean, like, you know, at least the Denver market has exploded over the past couple of years. Uh, you know, we all know Bigger Pockets is kind of based in Denver and a lot of right. people that that love real estate and real estate investing are uh, faithful followers of Bigger Pockets. Tell us about about um, Pine Financial Group and and you're the founder and president. So, you know, what do you guys do? How did you move into the space of, of founding this company and, you know, who are the types of customers that you work yeah. with? For sure. I'm going to go back just a little bit because when I got started in the business, much like probably you guys and a lot of your listeners, I was just like in the grind, right? Doing one deal at a time. And, you know, a lot of the agents out there are for a fee, the real estate investors are maybe wholesale fees or trying to flip a property. So I was in the grind. And what I learned was I really love the deal, the finding the deal and structuring it, putting it together. That's where my passion was. And and how you negotiate it and how you put the the offer in and write the contract, all of that has to do with the financing. How you fund your deal has everything to do with the structure. So I just kind of migrated over to the financing side and tried the mortgage broker route for a little while. That was terrible. I uh, needed more control in the business. So I started raising private capital. Um, this was in 2006. I was doing it with a, like a business partner. Uh, it was her company, but I was working for her. It was just her and I. And then in 2008, all hell breaks loose, as we know. And she decided that she preferred teaching people how to do real estate instead of actually doing deals. And I'm a trenches guy, so we we ended up separating. And then that's when I started Pine Financial Group. Um, so I had already been doing the private lending and private biz, more uh, private mortgage business two years before I started the company. Mm-hmm. Do you like how I'm in the naughty pine room right here in one of the four short term rentals? For <laughs> it's actually our entryway, but it's where we have a desk and it overlooks the mountains and the lake. It's just such a beautiful view. But there's some um, pine trees behind you. There, I'm sure there's evergreen trees. Yeah, there's some pine trees back there. There's a ton. I mean, like there's, and it was really cool driving around Colorado because it was it was a lot of birch and evergreen trees. Uh, but like you would actually see when I passed the different tree lines, you know, that oh, yeah. based on how high you're going. All right, that's cool. So Rory, can I ask stupid question number one? All right, I'll keep track. Private money, right? Like Rory, you don't have to explain this. I want Kevin to explain this. But like, can you explain? what private money means when you're raising private money? Because again, this is a term that gets thrown around a lot in our space. Yeah, I think people nod along, but they don't really know what that means. Yeah, because it, it can mean a couple of different things. Like I get the question a lot, like what's hard money mean? And like, there's no dictionary definition for this. This is just jargon that we use in the in the industry. Um, so private money could be a couple of things. It could be literally private individuals funding your deal. So a lot of people, as you mature in the business, you'll go out and you raise your own capital from friends, family, colleagues, the RIAs, the bigger pockets, that kind of thing. And it's just individuals helping each other out, really. So it's the pricing can vary a lot because it's it's just two people trying to negotiate on their own behalf. Um, but what gets interesting is there's actually an industry around this now. So when I got started, it, it was like the hard money lender is kind of rare to find. Um, now, hard money is that term is trying to be recoined by some of the um, advocates in the industry. But that all that is is private money brought in by institutional type investors. So think about, I shouldn't have said institution because that could lead you down a different path, but think about a more sophisticated real estate investor that has access to private money, loaning it out to other investors. So they're, they're charging fees basically. Uh, but oftentimes that's all private money coming into that hard money lender and that's how they fund it. Answer the question. Yeah. I mean, it certainly clarifies it a bit. Rory, I've always been I never liked the term hard money. What do you think about that, Rory? You know, it just feels like, I don't know, it doesn't feel like it's hard to get. It just feels like a rock's going to hit you if you screw up or something. I don't know. Yeah. It definitely feels like a pejorative for a certain and a certain aspect of private loans. Kevin, yeah, you said something there that you worked as a mortgage broker for a while, but you kind of ran up against the limitations of that role. And I kind of want to draw a line here for our listeners. You know, what is the value of a mortgage broker? When is it right to to work with a conventional mortgage broker? And when should you be looking at other options? I think brokers are fantastic for your business. And this is going to go for brokering money. And when I say brokering, all you're doing is bringing two people together, right? And, and charging a fee for it. But bro- if you're brokering money, it's huge because they have relationships that you might not have. And uh, like in real estate, a lot, uh, like if a real estate agent or real estate broker, those are super valuable to a, an investor also because they help find deals and have access to the MS and all of this. So do you absolutely need a mortgage broker necessarily to be successful in the business? No, because you can build relationships with banks and private money and hard money that you guys don't like the term, but you could do all of those things. Yes. But 
a mortgage broker has access to banks that have access to Fannie and Freddie money, and that's the cheapest money you can get. So if you're not working with a with a broker, uh, at least have that tool in the belt. We talk about tools in the, the real estate investor tool belt all the time. Um, you might want that tool. So I would definitely say that it's an important piece of the business. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a bit about active and passive real estate investing. You know, before we hit record and we were kind of going over some of the topics for the podcast, you mentioned Wall Street versus Main Street and the difference between active and passive. So talk a little bit about that. Like, how can people understand active and passive? What are the differences between Wall Street and and Main Street that we all live in? Yeah, so there's two different things here. So we're talking about Wall Street versus Main Street. There's a lot of people, and I know this is not going to be aired today, so who knows what's going to happen by the time you guys post this, but... There's a lot of people that think the stock market's in for a rough ride and it's, there's some volatility ahead and, and potentially some some massive correction. Now, I'm not necessarily in that camp, but I understand that there's risk in, in Wall Street, right? Um, Main Street, it just feels more comfortable to me. Main Street is like the house down the street. You can invest in that house down the street. That's why real estate investors, um, a lot of times why they're attracted to real estate over, over a Wall Street type investment. So that's one here. And then the active versus passive, if you're if you decide to invest in Main Street and you want to invest in uh, real estate, you could invest by owning the property or you could be a more passive investor and either invest in somebody else's deal and be an equity player in that deal, or you could be on the debt side, which is where I play and I, where I love. Um, the reason for that is it's totally passive and it's safer because debt is a priority over equity. Um, so when it really, when we talk about passive versus active, it's just how much, how much effort do you want to put into it? Maybe how much risk are you willing to take? Clearly, if you own the asset, if you own the rental property, the short-term rental, you have your tenants paying off your mortgage for you. You have the appreciation benefits. You have the tax benefits of owning the real estate. Um, and you possibly can get some cash flow out of that as well. So it could pay higher to be active. Just how much How much are you willing to do for that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's hard to be an active investor if people are working full-time jobs and have families, you know, the time is finite. So I, I definitely understand why people want to include some passive investment investments in their portfolios. So Kevin, so do you work with people uh, and then you connect them with passive investments and people that are raising capital or what's your, what's your role in that process? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Jason, because our business confuses people sometimes because we really have two distinct sides to it. Um, we we have money that we have to bring in from private investors. So that would be your passive side. So if you're looking for just, what do they call it? Mailbox money. If you're looking for that, that would be on this side of the business. If you are actively trying to fix and flip or buy short-term rentals or or do some type of value add or repositioning, that would be the other side of our business where we loan the money out to you. Now on the passive side where I'm super proud of and excited is we got approved uh, almost two years ago now. So, so I'm still excited about it, but it's been a little while. Um, we got approved, our fund got approved to offer publicly. So now we don't have the restrictions of accredited versus non-accredited investors. Um, and we can advertise a, a rate and promise that rate. Um, so it's very different than most syndications or most uh, other funds out there. Um, so that's that's huge for us. So one way we could work together on the passive side is investing in a public mortgage fund with 15 years track record. Mm-hmm. Passive investing in the mailbox money, I think for some people, it just isn't sexy enough, right? It doesn't have- Totally right. Yeah, it doesn't have the glitz of like, you know, pointing at your place because oftentimes you're investing in a large property in a city that could be distant from you. So you're really just seeing it on paper, on a computer screen, and then you're collecting the money that was promised to you. And, you know, we all know investors, like people can get antsy, right? You're like, I'm going to do another deal or yes. I, you, know, you can't sit still. Where do you think some folks where passive investing might be a good idea for them? Like where, where does it fit into their, uh, their portfolio and their profile? Like who are those people that have been your best customers or your repeat customers that appreciate what they're getting out of, you know, and a passive investment? Yeah. So the best clients that we have on that it, passive side is people who are experienced in real estate because they know how safe it is. So think about your real estate agents or your real estate attorneys. We have a lot of those investing in our in our fund because they understand that we're at a low loan to value in a senior debt position. It kind of doesn't get safer than that, in my opinion, unless you're FDIC insured. And even that's in question recently. So real, real estate-backed um, assets, 
those are the clients that enjoy it the most. Now you're right. It's not sexy. Look, we watch TV on HDTV and we see these fix and flippers and, and how much money they're making. And, and all of that is really kind of fun. And like you say, chasing the next deal, you go to the RIA and you could tell them like, I just finished two flips. That's fun. And it makes you feel good. One of my biggest mistakes in my career was setting goals around number of doors I own or number of properties or projects I wanted to work on. And I did that because I thought that it was impressive. So a little bit of humble pie here. Um, what I ended up happening is 2008, it freaking took me down. So I think a passive investment for some diversification is for everybody, honestly. Yeah. Number of doors is such a terrible metric. I hate like, it. I hate it. You know, it's Rory and I have talked about this. We've talked with other podcast guests about it. I think that we're we're part of the machine, right? We have a podcast about real estate and law, and we're talking to someone like you that's in this space. And I think that a lot of our forebears and people that have real estate podcasts always just talk about size and magnitude. And if you want to be an investor and you're getting on these podcasts, like I think you're more likely to get on a podcast when you have 75 doors than when you have three, right? But so, so I think it kind of fed itself, like it fed, it fed the machine Agreed. and the monster. But I just look at that as just a lot of work, you know, and it, it depends on where you are in your lives, right? Like Rory and I, we're a little bit later in our working careers, right? Like, you know, we, I at least am versus Rory. I mean, I worked for 25 years before I stopped working in a W2 job and now I'm just doing the investing. But if I was in my 20s, I could see myself, whoa, like accumulate, get the doors, like be the guy that goes to the, you know the RIAs and talks about your flips. Are, do 20 year olds or 25 year olds, like are they investing in passive investments or is this like something where you see people later in their career, they're established, they have money to park, they want to get in the space, they don't want to leave their job yet. That feels like more of the profile. I'm thinking about what you said, Jason, about you were, if you were younger, you'd be chasing those doors. And I just think why, like what's, what's the point? Is it just ego? Or are you trying to increase your bottom line? Because there's ways to increase bottom line without just increasing the number of doors, right? So whenever I hear someone say, I own 1,200 or whatever, I've syndicated 1,200 doors or whatever it is, that's fantastic. Are you making any money? You know, that's what I... To answer right. your question about the passive side, look, fix and flipping, this is a, an example. Fixing and flipping, we call, we call you a real estate investor. And I happen to love fixing and flipping because I loan to those. I make money when you fix and flip, so thank you mm -hmm. very much. Right. Uh, right. But... That's just a job because as soon as you stop flipping, you are, your income stops. So how do we call that a investing at all? It, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's a, it's a high paying job, which is fantastic, but it's clearly, a, it's clearly a job. So my, my suggestion and what a lot of the experts will tell you is if you could take money out of your income and invest it for passive, passive growth or passive income, that's how you're going to get rich. It's easy to get rich in real estate because it creates all these opportunities to invest passively. And then you could just keep doing it, right? Pull money out of where you're earning it and put it into a passive investment. That's the that's the formula. So Rory, let's talk about some legal considerations. Uh, you know, for people that need to work with a company that is doing you know hard money lending or private investing, uh, or is going to work as a passive investor with kind of that same company that has two two sides of the company. Um, what are some things that you would think should be thought about on the law side of of those enterprises? Well, I mean, you're you're wading into a lot of regulation, um, and you need to really be mindful of kind of all the traps that are out there, um, from the SEC regulations to the consumer protection regulations to um, kind of the the, the corporate instruments. Um, you're getting hit. It's like a, a Law exam question: the number of different areas of law that touches when you start working on, um, a you know a, a debt deal or syndication deal. As any person that's going into it, work with a professional. Um, if you are going to try to to syndicate and lend, don't do that too casually. That's something you really need to be able to dig in down and and do correctly. Um, and if you are somebody who's investing in it, make sure that they've the person you're partnering with has done the same. Um, it's a highly regulated space, and whoever's behind it needs to really be aware of the different rules, um, make just to make sure that they're following them all. I've been smiling there, so I'm well, sure I got there. Yeah, what are the what, what are the, I mean, I don't know how yeah, we have, but go for it. What are the, what are the questions your attorneys ask you, and what are these stories? 
Well, Rory, I, oh my gosh, I wish I'd met you t uh, 15 years ago. Like I started this business and I was working with my mentor and partner at the time. And she was saying this, Hey dude, we're the wild west. You don't need to worry about this stuff. And, and so we're out there raising money and brokering private money notes. And, and then one of my competitors said, yeah, what'd you think about that? That licensing test? Like how did, how'd you do on that? And I was like, what are you talking about? Blew my mind. So you know what I did? Here's another huge mistake in my career. I called the state of Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies and asked them, this is how I described it. This is my business. This is how I operate. Do I need a license for this business? Oh my God. You think the regulators are on my side? No, I should have absolutely called the securities attorney and asked for their input. And then we could have approached this totally different. I went directly to the regulator and I got an invitation into their office. And this was one of the hardest, most stressful times of my entire life. I went under investigation. They dug through 10 years of history. They called the borrowers, investors. I had to basically lift the skirt, right? And it turns out I, I got through it just fine. And I got a compliment, which is I'm very proud of too. You're doing it better than we even require you. You're disclosed. You're over, if that's possible, over disclosing. Um, you're just not getting the disclosure signed and you don't have the license. So those are your two mistakes. So studied up, went and got the test, got the bond, uh, went and got the license, but man, that could have taken me down. I didn't know because I didn't know. Yeah. That sounds like a frightening invitation. I'm not sure I'd want that invitation. Oh, he was like six, six. And he had this freaking belt with a gun. He comes in and says, I'm, I'm the investigator. And he throws his card, uh, in front of me, it's big giant, uh, you know, like the apprentice show, Donald Trump, that yeah. giant boardroom table. It felt like that. Uh, it's terrible. Yeah, I don't know if they'd have a gun in Massachusetts, but, you know, Colorado's a little bit... Exactly. Had a gun. It's like, yeah, they had a gun for <laughs> Hey, what are you guys working on these days? Like, what's the rest of the year look like? Oh, we're doing really well. So it's very interesting when you have the bank struggles like we're seeing right now. Banks tend to tighten up. They get a little bit more conservative. Um, and then you have bank runs and that kind of thing. But and speaking of that, the flight to quality, that we're seeing a lot more investors come in because of that. Um, they just don't feel safe and with FDIC insured stuff. Um, so that's been great for us. But when banks tighten like this, there's not a lot of options for real estate investors. They're just starting to get turned down more with their their lending. So they're going to the private money and hard money. And so we're seeing an uptick in, in our investors and an uptick in our borrowers. So for us, it's been great. Mm -hmm. It surprises me. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, just you, you said something about, you know, being unsure of FDIC insured stuff. Like, that's the point of the FDIC. Like, we're not supposed to be afraid of that. You know, we saw what happened, you know, recently with some bank runs on some banks that unfortunately didn't have solid balance sheets and, you know, they paid the price and so did a lot of their investors. Um, but yeah, I mean, people are looking for not just returns, but more security. Real estate tends to be a secure place to put money. Obviously, it's nothing is fully secure, but um, right. it doesn't surprise me that, that, you're seeing some folks that are investigating this as an option for probably the first time ever. But yeah, I mean, the FDIC is one piece of it. They, they've got 1.23% of the required, 1.23% of the insured deposits. And you, who knows what the actual deposits are, right? Because they cap it at the 250. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why it's in question. And then you go into T-bills or some type of treasury, and that's where it's supposed to be safe. But what brought down Silicon Valley? It was their investment in these super safe, you can't lose assets. So I just question the how safe is the treasury investment? Something like real estate, especially real estate lending, secured by real estate and it turns. We're, like us, we're, we're financing fix and flip. So there's constant cash movement, the velocity of capital, and that creates liquidity and it creates some security and safety. Um, you're limited to your market risks. I mean, this is why we're seeing people move over. It makes perfect sense to me that something that is, you know, really tangible and physical, that real estate offers a value that everybody can see and look at that beats out certain financial instruments that certainly beats out crazy things like crypto. But what I'm interested in this market as things are moving around, it's not just that real estate's doing well categorically, but where do you see the market struggling? Where do you see the market doing phenomenally well? I guess in terms of geography, asset class, what are some of the observ observations that you have this year? Geography is a tough one for me because we are, we're pretty focused on our, on our, we take investors in from all over the country, but when we deploy that capital, we're very focused on geographically because you have to understand the area to keep the money safe. So that's going to be a tougher question for me to answer, but 
if you're looking more of a ma macro level, like I think we're in a bit of trouble. I think residential real estate is going to be uh, fairly stable just because of the inventory crisis and the extremely high demand for it. The government is trying to break that. They've got to get unemployment higher than it is. It's at three and a half as we're recording this. They really want it around five would be my guess to get inflation under control. So we're going to start seeing more inventory hit. When people lose jobs, they're going to sell assets, right? So we're going to start seeing some of that where I really think that the opportunities, I, I'm going to say trouble, but they are, I should be saying opportunities, are is in the commercial space. And the reason for that is because it's so sensitive to interest rates and we're not going to see rates come down for a while. We just can't because of the inflation problem. And so how do you, we still have apartments across the country selling in the fours and five cap rates, but you're borrowing money at six and a half percent. How does that math work? You can't pay more for the money than the, the asset is returning in a return. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So I think that, I think that cap rates have to increase at some point. You know, the only way when a cap rate increases, the value comes down. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start seeing more opportunities um, in the commercial space for that. And the, the sheer amount, which is all over the news, the sheer amount of loans coming due in the next two years, um, yeah. that's going to create a problem as well. Maybe you could explain that a little bit to people who don't quite understand commercial financing. We yeah. we actually do have one commercial loan, which you know it's, it's amortized over a certain period of time. I think that it, there's a balloon payment after a certain amount of time as well, where basically I'm supposed to refinance this thing, right? So explain commercial financing and maybe how it's a little different from residential financing. Yeah, so commercial lenders are, I, I want to say smarter, but they made some mistakes recently, but they don't do a 30-year fixed loan because you're taking all the interest rate risks. So they want to shorten that up so that if if interest rates rise like they are right now, they could recast that loan or or redo that loan and, and charge the higher rate. They just don't want to lock in those low rates. So they might give you a 25-year amortization. The only point of that is to set the, the payment you're going to make. That doesn't mean you could pay, you pay it off over 25 years. That's just used to set the payment. Then they're going to have a five-year term, for example, or maybe seven. Sometimes you'll see longer than that, but not usually. So let's say it's a five-year term. That means when that five years is up, you got to pay off that loan. Now, is it refinancing? Is it? Is it maybe they modify the loan for you? Is it selling the asset? I don't, I don't know, but the loan is due. You have to pay it off. Here's where the problem comes in. Interest rates have doubled. So what used to qualify at a 3% will not qualify at a 6% rate because the biggest qualifier in commercial is the DSCR, debt service coverage ratio. The asset has to pay the payment, not you personally. So what happens when they no longer qualify? The DSCR is out of whack. And these banks may or may not renew or may or may not refinance. And then you have regulators saying you can't have assets on your books that don't meet the guidelines. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So this is going to create a problem. As a real estate investor and you're, on your commercial loan, when that comes due, you may have to bring cash to the table to keep that DSCR at the at the threshold the bank wants. Mm -hmm. And whether you have that or not, I have no idea, but I know a lot of people don't, right? And so how do they how do they get themselves out of that mess? Yeah. I know with ours, it, you know, it's a small um, commercial condo that we own in Boston, and we just uh, took out a line of credit on it, actually, and they evaluated it two different ways, one based on comp sales and then one based on the income of the property. Like I supplied a lease, you know, for the lease that we had in place there. And it was actually interesting to watch the entire appraisal process, you know, and how that was, uh, how those two things factored in. They basically took the average of those two as kind of what the interest things to to come to to come to the um the valuation because the the lease valuation was slightly higher than the comp valuation but um yeah i mean it, it's definitely been a different process for me to think through that commercial and if you're listening to this and you're interested in, in doing some small commercial loans there are some differences that you're just going to have to realize you know many of them that kevin mentioned many you could just learn online but you know it works similarly to residential loans but it's not you know a one-to-one -one, um comparison uh you know, but uh, w one more uh, question I have for you before we get to the final couple questions. Um, I did read an article about downtowns and how there is a push to get people more downtown. And an asset class either seems to be emerging or has emerged of companies that are taking large, vacant commercial buildings and making them into residential in these downtown areas. Are you working in that space at all? Or have you considered it in any of the markets that you're in? I mean, I know. Boston was pretty far down the list of like a return to office. It was at fifty percent vacant, you know, occupancy. Whereas some of the top ones were back to 80, 90 percent occupancy. San Francisco was at thirty, 
you know, just for comparison. It's easy, right? Yeah, it is. It's wild. But is that an asset class that you are working in or have or will be working in? Or, or what do you see in in terms of folks that are going to be converting these large scale commercial buildings into downtown residential? Yeah. And Jason, I agree with you 100 percent that that's the trend. Now, we're sitting in hotels also. So we, we've got a handful of hotel conversions on our books. Um, we have one office conversion on the book. Office seems a little bit tougher because you're running all new plumbing and it's just not as easy to convert. Um, but look, you have someone like like Brookfield, which is one of the top real estate investors in the country, giving properties back to the bank, office buildings, full office, like big office buildings. Just here you go. We're not going back to what we talked about. It doesn't DSCR. So here you go, bank. So when you start seeing these office, to your point, when you start seeing these hit the market, they're not going to, they have to be repurposed because there's just no demand, right? So you got to chase the demand. Um, I'm not doing anything of that scale. Our biggest loan is like 4 million bucks. I don't want to go anything over that just so we can stay diversified. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you that we are seeing that trend for sure. Yeah. And another use case that we have in Boston, it was just announced that some of the hotel towers downtown in the back there are being repurposed into uh, student housing and dormitories for some of the schools that need more housing for their students. So, you know, growing universities like Northeastern and Boston University um, and housing is such a premium in Boston. Uh, I guess there's some hotels where the owner decided, all right, I'll give you the whole building, BU or Northeastern, whatever school it was, saying, put your kids there. You know, we'll, we'll convert some of the spaces, the common spaces into lounges and spaces that students would remember. But I think back to when I was in college, it, wouldn't have occurred to me to stay in a hotel downtown, but you know, if they're going to recast it as a student dorm, that makes all the sense in the world. But that's another, just an aside. Some of the, some of those fantastic. I mean, like Boston's very student heavy uh, population. Not all not all cities have that. Well, great. Well, this has been a, a fascinating conversation, Kevin. Rory, do you have any other final questions for Kevin before we get to our last three questions? No, I think we've covered the bases, and I just want to make sure he has a chance to to answer the finals. All right. Well, we'll answer these now. Then, Kevin, you can tell everyone where they can reach out to you if they want to learn more um, about Pine Financial Group. So uh, we ask these of all the guests that come on the podcast just as a way to wrap it up and get to know you a little bit better. Uh, first question, if you can get on stage for a half an hour and talk about any subject in the world with zero preparation, what would that be? Oh, this one's an easy one for me. Look, I, I really think that the, the the gap between education and results is the biggest problem real estate investors have. So how do you bridge that gap? Um, so, and it's overcoming fear. It really comes down to um, being okay and comfortable with the fear of failure. So I would be talking about that. Mm -hmm. All right. Second question, uh, tell us something that happened early in your life or career that impacts the way that you're working today. Yeah, we talked about it. It's the, how I set my goals. The questions you ask to other people in sales and marketing and the questions you ask to your own self mean everything. It's so important to get quality questions. And and that has the same thing to do with goals. If your goals aren't quality, you're going to make mistakes like I did and start buying properties that aren't any good just so you can say you got another door. Quality questions is key, right? I worked in sales for a long time. I was a sales manager for many years. And it was always overcoming objections is kind of the goal that the salespeople had. And you overcome objections by asking questions and probing and finding out exactly what the reason is why you're even having the meeting in the first place. What's the pain point? How can we help solve the pain point, right? If you're not asking questions or as a personal investor, if you're not starting with your why, like why are you doing this in the first place? Like what is your personal question? Then forget it. Like nothing else really matters. Like if you could answer that question, then you have that in your head that any conversation you have like this one you know, when you ask questions of the people you're speaking with, it shows a genuine interest of learning you know, about that person. And it actually gets information out where you're not just pitching somebody for a half an hour about something that's irrelevant to them, right? You're asking good questions. And that's a really great, um, great takeaway. Final question we have for you. Tell us um, what you're listening to or watching or reading these days, anything in the world. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm in my car right now. I'm, I'm trying to be the best father I can be. So I'm listening to strong daddies, strong daughters, hmm. just so I could be, because I've, I've got two two daughters and I just want to be the best I can for them. How old are your daughters? Uh, they're 13 and 15 right now. So I screen. We're in middle school and we're dealing with all that. So yeah, yeah. I need to be, need to be a better communicator. Well, you know, you could say that you're in the thick of it with any age. I mean, like our daughter's four and, you know, you could say, oh, you're in the thick of it. And I'm like, oh, your daughters are 13 and 15. 
oh, you're in the thick of it, man. It's a whole different set of challenges, but you know, it's um, it's good. Different. Yeah, true. There's so much information out there. Also, it's very different from the past. I think that parents these days, you know, the ones that really take a genuine interest in being a better, uh, a better parent, are educating themselves. You know, because some of this comes naturally, and some of this you got to learn, right? Yeah, I mean, and practice. Like I, I just got done with another book on empathy for teenagers or something, and it's like this all sounds great as I'm listening it on Audible in my car, but how do I actually implement this? Like you got to actually, just like real estate, you got to actually make the effort and practice and and and, and try it. We we actually have to have empathy for teenagers. That's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you know, I'll file that one away. Um. So this is great. So Kevin, uh, please tell everybody where they could reach out to you if they want to learn more information about you or Pine Financial Group. Yeah, so there's two here, quick. Um, if you're interested in, in passive investing and, and don't want to work with me, you want to go out and, and charge a little bit more interest maybe or try to increase your profitability, fantastic. I just don't want to see you get hurt. I see a lot of people going in this business and make mistakes. Going into a second position is a big mistake, I think. Um, and people make that one. So I wrote a report on on just how to do it, how to be safe about it. And um Give that away for free. You can find that at thepinereport.com. So thepinereport.com. If you want to reach out to me, the best way is through the website, uh, pinefinancialgroup.com. All right. Rory, where can people learn about you? Uh, you can find me from either one of my businesses, uh, my real estate brokerage, Next Home Title Town. That's nexthometitletown.com. Or my law practice, Urban Village Legal. That's urbanvillagelegal.com. And if you'd like to learn about me, I'm probably hiding somewhere in the woods in New Hampshire. Uh, or you could just email me because internet does work here. Jason at nexthometitletown.com. I should know my email address at this point. We love comments and questions. If you want to be a guest on the podcast, please reach out to us. If you have questions for Kevin or Rory and can't get a hold of them, feel free to reach out to me and I'll pass them along. And that's that. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us for a podcast uh, from our third favorite state of Colorado. Please let us know if you're ever out east. We'd love to... Love to show you around the Northeast. That sounds great. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for listening to the podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please give us a great rating. We love ratings and we love all your comments and we hope that you will subscribe and listen to the next episode as well. So thank you very much. This has been the Real Estate Law Podcast because real estate is more than just pretty pictures and law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. We're powered by Next Home Title Town, Greater Boston's progressive real estate brokerage. More at nexthometitletown.com. And Urban Village Legal, Massachusetts Real Estate Council, serving savvy property owners, lenders, and investors. More at urbanvillagelegal.com. Today's conversation was not legal advice, but we hope you found it entertaining and informative. Discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Thank you for listening.